from our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. Now tonight, I want you to turn with me to a familiar passage of Scripture, Galatians, the sixth chapter, Galatians, the sixth chapter and the 14th verse. But God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I under the world. Just after the war, Cliff Barrows and I uh, came together. He led the singing and I did the preaching. And his wife and my wife and the four of us went to England and we lived in England during the winter of 1946 and 47. Now London was almost totally devastated. And one of the things I remember is that in all that devastation after the war and all the rubble, there stood St. Paul's Cathedral. And on top of St. Paul's was a cross. I remember when Coventry Cathedral was being built because it had been destroyed during the war. And it was nearing completion. A cross was lowered by helicopter and placed on the top. A huge 25-foot wooden cross stands above the fields of the buried horror of Belson concentration camp. A tiny cross placed there by Sir Edmund Hillary, the first man to conquer the peak of mountains, is buried on the snow and the ice at the summit of Mount Everest. Now you, many of you, are very religious and you have embossed upon your Bibles a cross or you wear a the most educated men of his time. He could have gloried in his religion. He was very religious. He could have gloried in his ability to speak several languages. He was fluent in several. He could have gloried in the fact that he was a Roman citizen, but he didn't. Or he could have gloried in certain things about Jesus Christ other than the cross. His spectacular, miraculous birth, born of a virgin, the Virgin Mary, or the great teaching of Christ. Even today, educators say there's never been a teacher like Jesus Christ or his great social work, his compassion for the poor and the needy, his concern for the hungry and the sick, his amazing resurrection from the dead, his future glory when he's going to rule the world and his kingdom is going to come. He could have gloried in any of those things, but he said, no, I glory only in the cross. And he said, God forbid that I should glory in anything else except the cross. Why? Well, I want you to think a moment and look at that cross. It was the most cruel of all punishments because the victims sometimes would hang there for several days. It took them several days to die. And on this occasion, they were crucifying three people, two thieves, murderers, and Jesus in the middle. The soldiers entered the guardhouse and brought Jesus with the two other condemned men. They were beaten 33 times or 39 times on their bare backs with leather thongs with steel pellets on the end. A crown of thorns had been put on Jesus' brow. A cross was laid upon his back. The procession started. Jerusalem was filled with a carnival-like atmosphere at that time. And the procession went through the main streets so that all might see that the criminal and be warned of a similar fate if he broke the laws of Rome. A big crowd was following. Just a few of Jesus' friends were following. And Jesus became weakened by the loss of blood and he fell. And so Simon of Cyrene, an African, helped him carry the cross. The soldiers went quickly and methodically about their task of driving home the nails in his hands and the spike through his feet. The crowd mills around jeering. He saved others. Himself he cannot save. They laughed and they mocked and they made fun of him. Come down. Do just one more miracle, they said. But he didn't do it. He stayed there. And you know why he stayed there? Because of you. Because he loved you. Because you see, only in Jesus Christ can we find forgiveness of sins. He was bearing our sins on the cross. People ask me constantly as they write, is there any hope for me? Can Christ save me? Prostitutes, alcoholics, robbers, murderers, prisoners, 
people filled with racial prejudice, people who hold in their hearts anti-Semitism. Is there any hope for me? People who have done many evil things, both corporately and privately. Is there any hope for me? A bishop of a church in another country came to me one time, some years ago now, and he told me that he did not believe that he was saved. He said, I've been to theological school in England. He said, I've been a bishop now, and he told me how many years. But he said, I have so many doubts that, I'm, that my sins are forgiven and I'm going to heaven. And he said, I've come to you to ask you if you would pray for me and pray with me. And very simply, I talked to him just like he was a little child, as though he had never heard the gospel before. Tears came streaming down his face and he got on his knees and he prayed a very simple prayer, which indicates to me that you can even be a clergyman, be in the church. I know a man in St. Louis, pastor of a large church. He was converted to Christ under his own preaching. He'd never known Christ and suddenly the Spirit of God spoke to him. I know a man here in Boston who was pastor of a church that was dying. He had a brilliant education from one of your great theological seminaries here. And his little daughter got sick and he thought she was dying. And he said, Lord, he said, if you will raise up my daughter from now on, I'll turn to the Bible and preach nothing but the Bible and accept your word as the word of faith. And that happened. Within a year, his church was packed out. Now he's pastor of a great church in Florida. Some of you know him. Paul gloried in the cross because it is the only way of salvation. Nothing else will save. The cross is the only way. There is a way, the Bible says. Oh, there, there are other ways of salvation. So we're taught by many teachers that seemeth right. But the end thereof is the way of death. There's only one way. By the cross. And that's one reason why people don't like to talk about the cross or the exclusiveness of salvation. We like to think that there are many ways. And there are many ways that people worship and there are many ways that people pray. And God does hear the prayers of all people all over the world. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord is going to be heard. But there's only one way outlined in the Bible and I as a minister of the gospel must declare unto you what the apostle Peter said. There's therefore now no other name under heaven whereby we must be saved. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. I didn't say that. Jesus said it. Jesus said, as I've already quoted, enter in at the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be that go in there. Because narrow is the gate and hard is the way which leadeth unto life. And few there be that find it. Notice he says it's hard. It's not easy to follow Christ. You pay a price. He said, if you're not willing to deny self and take up the cross, you cannot be my follower. You see, we would like something cheap and something easy. His demands were so high that many people refused to go with him any further. They'd go so far and then they'd turn away. Because he turned to a crowd one day and said, count the cost. Count the cost. If you follow me, that means that I become Lord of your life. If you follow me, that means you become my learner, my disciple, and you must do my commands. You've got to love your neighbors yourself if you follow me. If you follow me, you've got to be concerned about the needs of the world. If you follow me, You've got to be willing to take up the cross. I'm going to die on a cross. I'm going to be executed. That means that you're willing to go back to your school and back to your home and back to your neighborhood 
and tell the people that you know Christ and let them see Christ in you. And that won't be easy. But if you'll do that, he'll be with you. He doesn't ask us to live the Christian life alone. I cannot live the Christian life. I'll be honest with you. I cannot do it. But Christ can live it through me if I will let him. And he can produce the fruit of the Spirit. He can give me a love and a joy and a peace that I'll never find anywhere in this world. He can give me the certainty of my eternal life. Now, Jesus also warned us that not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not preached in your name? And in your name we've cast out demons. And in your name we've done many wonderful works. And then he said, I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. You see, you can go to church. You can be a good person. And maybe really never know Christ. I know many people that live moral lives that are agnostics and even atheists. There comes a point, there comes a moment sometime, somewhere when you must receive Christ into your heart. Paul gloried in the cross because it expresses the depth of sin, because it shows the love of God, because it's the only way of salvation, and fourthly, because he knew that it gave a new dynamic to life. Once you've been to the cross, you can never be the same. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new, the scripture says. You'll never be the same once you come to Christ. I remember the night I came to Christ. I stood with about three or four hundred other people, made my commitment to Christ, and while I was standing there, I felt like a fool. I started turning around and go back. A woman next to me was weeping and I didn't have any tears. I had no emotion at all except fear, afraid that, of standing in front of so many people. But I went home that night and I remember it was a moonlight night. And we lived on a farm. And I looked out across the field and across the woods. And I knew something had happened to me that night. I didn't know what, if you'd asked me the next day what had happened to me, I could not have told you. I now know. That first step was so weak and my faith was so weak and I had so many doubts. But my goodness, the transformation that began working its way into my life over a period of time was so tremendous. And it's still working. And it's still growing. And I'm still learning. And it gets better every day. And then f fifthly, fifthly, it's a motivation for service. A motivation for service. Did you see Mother Teresa? getting that award and then she won the Nobel Peace Prize two or three years ago and she's won so many awards and she said I owe it all to the cross Martin Luther King received the Nobel Peace Prize and they asked him something about it and he said it was built upon my father's evangelical preaching I know his father and I knew Martin Luther King, of course. And his father always preached the gospel and believed in the cross. And so did Martin Luther King, Jr. Do you know Christ? It's a motivation for service. What motivates you? To go out and help the hungry and the poor and the oppressed. My son spends his time, a great deal of it, in the third world. Helping the poor and the needy, going to little dispensaries and little hospitals and sending doctors to help them. And he was out on one of those boats in the China Sea helping pick up those refugees a couple of years ago. What motivates him? Why does he go to some place in Africa or go all through New Guinea or go through India or Bangladesh or some of these places to try to help? Because he loves Christ. It's Christ that motivates him. 
What motivates you? Or do you have any motivation at all to help others? And then Paul gloried in the cross because he knew that it guaranteed a future life. The cross was followed by the resurrection. But God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. And the scripture tells us in a grand anthem in the book of Revelation, the fifth chapter. And they sang a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. And hast made us unto our God a kingdom of priests, and we shall reign on earth. What a glorious future we have because of the cross. Some of you are watching by television. Pick up that phone and call that number that's there right now. And talk to the person and tell them your need and share with them and they will talk to you. And you can find Christ tonight or you can find help for your problem or your need, whatever it is. Now, what was the attitude of the crowd that was there that day? Christ dying on the cross. First, there was the attitude of apathy. Sitting down, they watched him there. That's indifference. Many here this evening who are completely indifferent to what I'm saying and to the gospel. The mockings, the abuse, and the atrocity of that ancient pagan mob were less painful to Christ than the indifference of a modern world upon which the light of the gospel has been shining all these years. Here in New England, no place in all the world has had more gospel than you've had in your past history. How many today are indifferent? Too much is given, much is required. You see, more is going to be required of you. Where you've had the gospel for so many years and so many Bibles and so many churches and now the television and the radio, then those people in China or people in other countries that don't have the gospel as freely as we have it today. And then there's the attitude of the skeptic and the cynic. And they that passed by railed on him, wagging their heads and saying, Ah, oh, you that destroy the temple and you build it in three days, say to yourself, come down from the cross. And there are skeptics here tonight, I know that. We've had many a skeptic come to the meeting and have his life changed. I remember the great scientist from the University of Minnesota who came. Skeptical. But three days after that service, he found Christ and became a wonderful Bible teacher on the faculty at the university. Then there's the attitude that saves. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother and his mother's sister. And then there was the attitude of the centurion who said, truly, this is the son of the living God. My wife was born and reared in China. And in Chinese, the word come is written with three characters, each of which is a cross with a person on it. We're translating tonight in Chinese, both Mandarin and in Cantonese. The cross in all languages means come to the cross find salvation. Come to the cross and find peace. Come to the cross and find forgiveness. Come is the invitation of the whole Bible. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Come to the cross. I'm asking you tonight to come to the cross. You say, well, what do I have to do? Three things. Christ has paid the price on the cross. He's been raised from the dead. That is the heart of what is called the good news, the gospel. The good news is that God loves you. He gave his son to die for you. He will forgive you of your sins. He will give you eternal life tonight. You don't have to wait till tomorrow, tonight. That's the good news, but you must receive it. How do you receive it? First, by repenting of sin. That means to turn, to change your thinking, to change your mind, to change your attitude, and to change your way of living. Let Christ come and be in control of your life. That's repentance. Saying to God, I have sinned and I'm sorry for it. Forgive me. That's repentance. 
But then you must by faith receive him. And that word faith may trip you up. Faith means that you totally commit to Christ. Just as I'm standing on this platform and my body is committed to this platform. So you stand with your whole life and everything you have you put on Christ. Your hope is in him and him alone. He becomes the one that you trust totally and completely for your salvation. There was a minister preaching on the thief on the cross once and some man yelled from the congregation and said, what about that thief on the cross? And quick as a flash, the minister said, which thief? Because you see, one died and was lost and one died and was saved. And that's the only story of deathbed repentance in the whole Bible. So you better not wait. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. Nowhere in the Bible does it promise you tomorrow. And Jesus said you must do it publicly. He said, if you're not willing to acknowledge me publicly before men, I will not acknowledge you before my Father which is in heaven. That's the reason I ask people to come forward publicly. You see, your coming forward doesn't actually save you. It's coming forward as a symbol of an inward decision you're making in your heart. You're coming and standing with Christ at the cross and saying by coming, I do repent of sin. I do want to change. I do want his forgiveness. I do want a new life. I'm going to ask you right now to get up out of your seat and do what we've seen thousands through New England do. I'm going to ask you to come and stand in front of this platform and say by coming, I want sin forgiven. I want to know when I leave this stadium that Christ is with me and that Christ has forgiven me and that I'm going to heaven. If you have a doubt in your mind, don't you leave this stadium till you've settled it because you may never have another moment when your heart is this close to the kingdom of God. You're not here by accident. I believe you're here in the providence of God. You get up and come right now. We're going to wait on you. Hundreds of you, quickly. I'm going to ask that no one leave the stadium. This is a very holy and sacred moment. And you be in an attitude of prayer. You can bring your friend with you. If you're with friends or relatives or you've come in one of those buses, they'll wait on you. You get up and come and make this commitment. Here in Boston, we've already seen hundreds of people. And you that are watching by television, pick up the telephone and call the person on the other end and have a talk with them. You see that number there? As these are coming forward this evening. That number. God bless you. And be sure and go to church next Sunday. Night after night, we have seen hundreds of people respond here at Nickerson Field to commit their life to Jesus Christ. This is also a moment of decision for you. Make that telephone call right now by calling the number on your screen. Trained counselors are standing by ready to help you. If the lines are busy, just wait a few moments and call again. We'll be there as long as the calls keep coming in. Be sure and join us again tomorrow night for another telecast from the Boston New England Crusade and a special feature that Mr. Graham wants to present to you. Call a friend and ask them to share the program with us. Until then, Cliff Barrows here saying good night and may God richly bless you. Relationship with Jesus Christ. I would just call that number that is on the screen. There'll be someone there to talk with you, pray with you, and answer those questions. And remember, God loves you. If you would like to commit your life to Jesus Christ, please call us right now toll-free at 1-877-772-4559. That's 1-877-772-4559. Or you can write to us at Billy Graham, 1 Billy Graham Parkway, Department C, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28201. Or you can contact us on the web 24-7 at peacewithgod.tv. We'll get the same helps to you that we give to everyone who responds at the invitation. 
On behalf of Franklin Graham and the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, thank you for watching and thank you for your prayers. We still have a window of opportunity to reach a lost and dying world with the truth of God's love. It's not too late. We've got an opportunity to tell others about Jesus Christ. What are you going to do with it? From our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. Now the ninth chapter of Hebrews. Hebrews, the ninth chapter, the 22nd verse. These words. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness, no remission. And everywhere we turn, we meet blood, whether it's a highway accident or whether it's the various wars that are being fought in the world today, blood is being shed. Wherever we look, blood is being shed. And there's so much to say about blood in the Bible. Crime is the shedding of blood. The Red Cross stands for blood. A few years ago, one of the most popular novels was in cold blood. And Judaism and Christianity have both been called a bloody religion or a slaughterhouse religion. And it's true that the Bible speaks often about blood. And I want to answer in just a few moments tonight what the blood means and how you cannot get to heaven and you cannot have your sins forgiven unless the blood was shed for you on the cross. In Leviticus 17, 11, the Bible says, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I've given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh the atonement of the soul. That word atonement is used 80 times in the Old Testament. It's used 101 times in the New Testament. The word atonement. At one moment, bringing God and man together, making an atonement, taking man's place in death and suffering and hell upon that cross. Now, in the average person, you have five quarts of blood. It circulates, we're told, every 23 seconds, so that every cell in the body is constantly supplied and cleansed at the same time. The blood carries the garbage off, it carries off and it carries the oxygen in. And it's the most mysterious substance probably of the body. And it's composed, it composes the real life of the body. And the Bible teaches that all of us, whatever the color of your skin, whatever your background, we are all related by blood to Adam. We are made of the same blood. We don't know what color skin Adam had. We're not told whether it's black or white or yellow or brown, but we know that the blood is the same. We know that Jesus was not a white man, nor was he a black man. He came from that part of the world that touches Africa, Asia, and Europe. He probably had a brown skin as the people of that day did have. But the Apostle Paul said in Acts 17, He hath made of one blood all the nations of men that dwell on the face of the earth. We are made of one blood. We're all related to each other. And we all have our common origin in Adam and Eve. Now it's Adam's blood which courses in every man's veins. Whether he be black or white, Jew or Gentile, pagan or cultured, whoever you are, Adam's blood is in your veins. And this blood of Adam carries in it a disease a fatal disease, the sentence of death. The moment you're born, you're sentenced to die because in the bloodstream is death, a fatal disease that the Bible has labeled sin. In Romans 5, the Apostle Paul says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed on all men, for all have sinned. And he said, in the day, God had said to Adam and Eve, in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. You cannot eat of this particular tree. If you eat of it, 
you'll die. God was testing man because God had given man a gift, the gift of choice, the freedom of choice. Man could serve God and love God and build a world with God, or he could rebel against God and try to build his world without God. But God said, if you choose that way, you will suffer and you will die. You will die physically, you will die spiritually, you will die eternally. And man was tempted. He yielded to the temptation. He sinned. And by that one man's sin, your father and my father, Adam, death passed by sin to all men. And tonight, you and I, whoever we are, are under the sentence of death. Man suffers from blood poisoning. But so powerful was the poison of sin that thousands of years later, all of us who are related to Adam by human birth still succumb to the poison of sin which is transmitted to us through the blood. The penalty is death. And every person in this audience a hundred years from now will be dead. Fifty years from now, most of us will be dead. Ten years from now, a great portion of this great audience of 30,000 people will be dead. Now, where does the blood come in? God said, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. There has to be an atonement. There has to be a substitute for you who will take the judgment that you deserve, the death that you deserve, and that substitute became the Son of the living God, Jesus Christ. Even in the very beginning, God was teaching man that he could only come to him by the way of blood. Adam and Eve had sinned. They were naked. God slew some animals. The blood was shed and they were clothed with those skins so that they would not see their nakedness. The first murder was committed by Cain, their son, who slew Abel. Why? Because he became jealous of Abel. They had both brought sacrifices to God, but Cain had disobeyed God. He did not come by the way of blood. He tried to offer some vegetables to God, and God had apparently taught him that the only way is by blood, but Cain said, no, I don't want any of that kind of religion. God refused his sacrifice. He accepted Abel's sacrifice, which was blood sacrifice. And Cain became jealous and he slew his brother. And that was the first murder. And the first murder was committed in the name of religion. And all through history, men have fought in the name of religion. That's another subject entirely. But Noah, and Noah builded an altar unto the Lord and took of every clean beast and every clean fowl and offered burnt offerings on the altar. Blood was shed in Noah's day. Abraham, God said, Abraham, I want you to go and take your son Isaac. I want to, you to offer your son Isaac as a sacrifice. Abraham did not doubt God. He didn't argue with God. He obeyed God implicitly and he took his son on a three-day journey to Mount Moriah, where Jerusalem is located today. And there he laid his son on the altar, took his knife, and was ready to plunge it into his son's heart when God reached out and grabbed his wrist and said, No, Abraham. There's a ram caught in a thicket over there and his horns get him. He's the sacrifice. I now see that you trust me and believe in me. I want to ask you something. Do you believe in Christ do you believe in God that much that you'd do what Abraham did? No wonder he was called a man of faith. No wonder he's called the father of nations. He believed God so implicitly that he was willing to offer the only son, or he had had Ishmael, but the son of the bloodline on the altar because God had told him to do it. And then remember that night in Egypt, all the plagues had come and God had said, and the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. In other words, go out and get a lamb. 
I'm going to destroy the firstborn of every family in Egypt. I want you to get a lamb, slay it, take the blood, put it up on the doorpost. And when I see the blood tonight, when I pass through Egypt, killing the firstborn of every house in Egypt as a judgment upon Egypt because of their refusal to let the people of Israel go, I will pass over. It'll be a sign. And when the death angel came across Egypt that night and there was groaning and moaning and wailing in Egypt because the firstborn of every family died unless, unless the blood was there. He didn't say, when I see your good resolutions, when I see all your religious credentials. He said, when I see the blood, I will pass over. I want to ask you, have you been to the cross to have your sins washed away in the blood of the Lamb? You say, Billy, I don't like that kind of preaching. That, that's not modern preaching, I know. But the Bible is full of it. And without the shedding of blood on that cross, there's no forgiveness of sin. You can't be forgiven without the shedding of that blood. Let's come to the New Testament. The cross is the symbol of Christianity, whether it's Catholic, Protestant, Orthodox, whatever it is. On every church, you'll see a cross. The communion, what is it? We take communion every Sunday in some churches. What is it? The heart of the worship is the communion table and it speaks about the blood that was shed on the cross whether you're Catholic or Anglican or whatever you are when you take that cup to your lips it's symbolic of the blood that was shed for your sins Don, John the Baptist looked at the Lord Jesus Christ and he cried out behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world why did he use the word lamb? Jesus was coming as the sacrificial lamb, the lamb of God that God himself was going to offer for the whole human race. And because that lamb shed his blood on the cross, you can have eternal life. You can have forgiveness of sin. You can know you're going to heaven and you can become a new person tonight in Jesus Christ. I see Jesus weeping over Jerusalem. I see him perspiring in the garden. I see him shedding his blood on the cross. Fourteen times Jesus predicted his own death. He said he had come to give his life as a ransom for many. Remember the interview with Nicodemus where he said, you must be born again. He also said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. The death of Christ is mentioned 255 times in the New Testament. It is the very heart of the gospel. One half of all the gospel of John, one fourth of the other gospels given over to the time around the events surrounding the death of Jesus Christ. The death of Christ and the resurrection of Christ is the most important single historical event in the history of the world. Nothing else compares to it. If the blood of Christ doesn't forgive our sins and cleanse us, and isn't an atonement for our sins. And if he didn't rise from the dead, we're of all men most miserable and there is no hope upon the horizon of this world. There's no hope for you and there's no hope for the world. We're heading toward an Armageddon that'll destroy the human race and wipe it all out. But Christ did die. He did rise from the dead. He is coming again. There is hope. And I find that young people are reaching out for something to believe in, something to give themselves to, a cause to believe in, a flag to follow, a song to sing, something to change them, something to believe in. Give yourself to Jesus Christ, who was willing to go to the cross for you and who is going to rise from the dead and who's coming back someday to be the world ruler. Peter said that the blood redeems, for as much as ye know that ye are not redeemed with corruptible things such as silver and gold from your vain conversations received by tradition from your fathers but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish that's how you're redeemed not with silver and gold you can bring all the silver and gold you can get your hands on and bring it to the church that won't save your soul you can do good works all the rest of your life but that won't save your soul 
because you're saved not by your works, not by your goodness, you're saved by grace through faith, and that not of yourselves, not of works, lest any man should boast. When I get to the entrance to the kingdom of heaven, and if they should ask me what right I have to be there, I'm not going to say, well, Lord, I've read the Bible through a number of times, and Lord, I've preached to a lot of people while I was down there. I'm going to say simply to thy cross I cling. I come by the mercy and the grace of God that was in Christ on that cross. I come because of the shed blood upon the cross. You see, the blood carries with it the idea of life, and Jesus gave his life for us on the cross. Salvation is free to you and me, but it cost God his son. He had to redeem us. Because you see, God is a just God. And God could not just come along and say, Jim and Bill and Susie, Mary, Charlie, I forgive you. He would no longer be God. He couldn't be just. He couldn't be righteous. He would have been a liar. Someone had to pay the price for your sins. Christ paid the price for you. He took the judgment and the hell that you and I deserved on that cross. The Bible says, that without Christ we are slaves of sin. Whosoever committed sin is the slave of sin. And many of you tonight are slaves of sin. Somerset Maugham, in his book, Human Bondage, rejected God and became a slave to sin. The other night we saw on television in the United States the story of slavery the terrible and horrible story of slavery. But it featured John Newton. John Newton was a slave trader on the west coast of Africa. And John Newton became a slave of a slave. But one day in a thunderstorm, he was converted to Christ and he went back to England and became an Anglican clergyman and he influenced Wilberforce and he helped stamp out slavery in Britain, the first country in the world to stamp it out and led the way to the freeing of slaves all over the world. And he wrote that song, Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound that could save a wretch like me. And he was a wretch. If the Son, therefore, shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. There was a girl who came up here last night and she yelled out, I want my freedom. I wanted to shout back at her. You can be free in Christ. You shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. She might have been talking about she wanted freedom from her husband. I don't know. But Christ can free you and give you a free spirit and give you a joy and a peace that you've never known. The Bible says we are justified by the blood. We're not only redeemed, we're justified. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved just as if I'd never sinned. Justification is more than forgiveness. You and I say, well, I forgive you. God says, I justify you. I place you in my sight as though you've never committed a single sin. Totally innocent because of the blood. When he looks at you, he looks through the blood and he can't see your sins. That's the thrilling and marvelous thing. And one, uh, one other thing, he can't even remember your sins. You can remember your sins. The devil sees to that and he worries you with it, but God can't remember them. He can erase the tape of the sins in your life. And then the Bible says that the blood of Christ brings peace. And having made peace through the blood of the cross, peace between you and God. I wrote a book once called Peace with God. And when you have peace with God, you have the possibility of having peace in your family. You have the possibility of having peace in your heart. You have the possibility of easing those tensions and those problems in your community because you have peace with God. But it was brought by as the blood cleanses unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood in Revelation, the first chapter. Have your sins been cleansed? This is my blood of the New Testament which is shed for many 
for the forgiveness of sins. Are you sure that you've been to the cross and had your sins cleansed? The Bible says the blood reconciles. Your iniquities have separated between you and your God and your sins have hid his face from you. But now the scripture says they've overcome by the blood of the Lamb. I read about a man that was trying to climb to heaven by a ladder that he had built and he thought the way you did it was to put your good works here and then your good works in the next rung and your good works and you climbed up, up, up and you'd finally get to heaven. But he heard a voice that says, he that climbeth up any other way, the same as a thief and a robber, and the ladder fell. And he woke up out of his dream in his sleep and he said, if I go to heaven, I'm going to have to go a different way. Yes, you'll have to go by the way of the cross. Jesus said, if you're not willing to deny self and take up the cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. You know, we have blood banks. And I've had blood transfusions myself. And there's a blood bank that we can apply to by faith that will take our guilt and our sin away. We've read a lot about heart transplants, especially in South Africa a few years ago. And there were two factors that were needed for heart transplants. First, there had to be a donor. Jesus Christ is the donor tonight to you. Secondly, the patient had to accept or reject the heart that he received. Tonight, you have to accept or reject. Which will it be? There's no neutral ground. The gospel offers no neutrality. You take your stand with Christ at the cross and trust totally and completely in Him or you trust in your own goodness or something else which is a false way and a false road. I'm asking you tonight to surrender your life to Christ, to come to the blood that cleanses and let Him wash all that past away and give you peace and justification and eternal life. What do you have to do? First, you must repent of your sins. You cannot repent except with the help of God. Salvation is of the law. The Holy Spirit has to help you do the repenting. He'll do it. All you have to do is be willing. And that repenting means that you say, Lord, I'm sorry I've sinned and I'm willing to change my way of living. I'm willing to change my lifestyle. Are you willing to do that? Think about it. Jesus said, count the cost. Are you willing that every part of your life come under the Lordship of Christ and all your priorities be centered in Him. And then the second thing, by faith, by simple faith like a child, you receive Him as your Lord and Savior and your only Lord and Savior, trusting only in Him and what He did for you. And then thirdly, you're willing to follow and serve Him as a disciple going out to do good works in his name because of what he's done for you if you're willing to say that tonight I want you to get up out of your seat right now hundreds of you from all over this great stadium and stand in front of the platform and say by coming I want to join those 6,000 that have already come this week and I want to find Christ as my Lord and Savior I want my sins forgiven I want to know I'm going to heaven and after you've all come, I'm going to say a word to you, have a prayer with you. You may be a member of the church, you may be an officer of the church, or you may not be a member of any church. You may be Catholic or Protestant or Jewish, whatever you are, or you may not have any religion. Get up and come and join them right now as they come, quickly. And everyone else in an attitude of prayer as the choir sings. You're watching the Billy Graham Classics. Please call the phone number on the screen right now for spiritual help and guidance. As hundreds are responding to Mr. Graham's invitation to make a public commitment to Jesus Christ, you can make that same commitment right where you are. Just pick up the phone and call the number you see on your screen. Special friends are waiting to talk with you and pray with you about this most important decision.
You that are watching by television can see that down the aisles in this great stadium, every aisle is filled with people who are coming, hundreds of people, to make their peace with God and to have forgiveness of their sins because of the blood that was shed on the cross. That can happen to you where you are, in your home, in a hotel room, in a bar, wherever you are, you can say yes to Jesus Christ. He'll come into your heart. God help you to make that commitment. I'm praying that you will. And go to church next Sunday. If you just prayed that prayer with my father, or if you have any questions about a relationship with Jesus Christ, I would just call that number that is on the screen. There'll be someone there to talk with you, pray with you, and answer those questions. And remember, God loves you.